Thank you, sister. Yes, Elizabeth. My name is Elizabeth Sue. I have a question for the panel. It relates to the notion of citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen of a country? And uh, related to the um, history, the sense of history, crisis, and, sh and, and uh, you know, kind of shared history. In, in Bosnia, uh, during the war, many buildings disappeared. So the young ones who are now, you know, who are citizens, maybe have no sense of the physical presence of their country. So what does it mean to them to be citizens? And in Singapore, we are constantly pulling down buildings and building new things. <laughs> So I think the older citizens here feel that our historical buildings have more or less generally disappeared. So how do we instill a strong sense of citizenship among our young ones who have really not undergone any crises or any shared, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, incidents? So that's my question. Thank you, Elizabeth. Ambassador, maybe you could give your perspective from the, 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 the Bosnian experience of what's a citizen, and then we'll turn to Minister to give his comments on the Singapore experience of being a citizen. Part of the problem is definitely history. And uh, the war in Bosnia was stopped with the Dayton Peace Accord, and this is a war without winners and losers. All three sides, because the three warring sides in Bosnia, consider that they win the war. And after the war, always the winners are writing the history. These days, we have three different histories of the war in Bosnia. And our educational system is divided by ethnic groups. And we are teaching our children that our neighbors are our enemies. And uh, that is just now we are living in peace, but uh, uh, then international community intervene and we try to change the textbooks. But if it's not written black and white, it's between the lines. And the style is that uh, our neighbors are enemies. That's made a problem even with the feeling of belonging to the state, to, to the country. And the citizenship is one of the questions. Uh, in Bosnia, a lot of uh, Bosnian Croats, who are Roman Catholics, they took Croatian citizenship, beside the Bosnian one. A lot of uh, Orthodox Serbs took Serbian citizenship. So in Bosnia, a lot of people has two passports and two different citizenships. And it's enough to see the football match when Bosnia is playing against Croatia or is playing against Serbia, Half of Bosnia, it's against Bosnia. And uh, it's very difficult to feel that they are feeling like real Bosnians. I remember when we got one of the high representatives who is uh, representing the uh, international community to implement the Dayton Peace Accord. It was a British uh, politician, uh, Paddy Ashdown, and we had a dinner together. And he asked me, what can we do as an international community to help Bosnians to feel that they are Bosnians and to be proud that they are Bosnians? I said, the only thing that you can do is to arrange that the Bosnia became a world champion in football. And then everyone will be proud that he is Bosnian. He said, unfortunately, this is not my mandate. I said, if it's not your mandate, you don't have a chance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Just a quick, couple of quick responses. I think it goes back to the point that I mentioned just now. Actually, this whole concept of uh, citizenship, some people, uh, some academics have even written that this, this definition of nationhood and citizenship, does it even apply to the modern world? Some people say that I can be a citizen of Microsoft, you know, or a citizen of Google. And by the way, I think that Microsoft and Google GDP is higher than Singapore. Each one of them, I think, is higher than Singapore. So people say, you know, why, why do I need this? What, what does citizenship mean? You know, is it a passport? If it's a passport, then I can take any passport. Right? I just, a passport is just a legal document that allows me to travel from country A to country B. That's all right. So there are even, even people who question this. But if you ask me, then what defines citizenship? Is it shared memories? Yeah, I, I think it, it helps. Uh, but for a young nation, that, that's always problematic because we have only that much shared memories. 
then is it looking forward or looking back? Of course, you want to be anchored on some things at the back, but you must also constantly look forward. right? What is our shared destiny? Is another question to ask. Beyond what is our shared past? Okay, so I, pref I preface that. Because for us as a young nation, it's very difficult for us to find enough things to say that I'm defending the Chinese culture, I'm defending the Malay culture, the Indian culture. We all have our different cultures, but we all can have a common destiny. And if you look at the Americans, that's what they define, their sense of identity. It's not so much as a common past. It goes back to just now the point, the difference between rojak and mash. You know, you, 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 you don't put everything, all the ingredients into a blender and then you smash them all of them up. Uh, that, is re that, that is really assimilation. We all have a different part. It all brings different tastes, but together it brings out something of a higher order. And that's what we are aspiring to do. When it comes to historical buildings, we just have a practical problem, you see. Our space is finite. But I always remind myself that I have to be very cautious when I talk about preservation of the past because every generation will want to preserve what belongs to us. I think it's natural human instinct. But it is also important for us to, aware, to be aware that actually our memories are also built on somebody else's, uh, somebody else giving up their memories. I mean, you look at my constituency now, Bona Vista. We are very emotional about our old Bona Vista. But which is the old Bona Vista? You know? Actually, when I... Can you hear me? When I talk to the older people, when I talk to the older people, the older people has a different version of what is older Bona Vista. You know? If you start long enough, they will tell you that Bona Vista, the 6th Avenue Plains area, used to belong to, a, it used to be a cemetery of a particular Chinese clan. I think it's the Hainan, is it Hainan or Hakka? Or no, Hakka, Hakka. And many years ago, the government requisite the, requisite the whole place, which is why today in Bona Vista you have this nice little cemetery that is quite atypical of Chinese cemetery. Chinese cemeteries are unlike the, the Christian cemetery where you know, they have the crosses on very neat rows. You go to Bona Vista behind the SPC petrol kiosk today, uh, between block 32 and the petrol kiosk, you see very neat rows of uh, tombstones, 3,000 of them. And you ask the old generation, where did these tombstones come from? They used to be the 3,000 plus graves that were scattered around the whole 6th Avenue, current Gimo, Bona Vista, and uh, current Bona Vista and the Commonwealth area. The government asked the clan for permission, took the land, and re exhumed the graves, and then re. Uh, have, have them set up in this particular place down there. And this was given to the clan for the 100 years. right? And then they built a new set of memories on top of that. The new generation, and it didn't start off with uh, even the current Buna Vista, it started off with Kampong plantations and whatnot. Then after that, that also moved on, and then now it became the old Holland village and parts of uh, Buna Vista, Gimo, and so forth. And now we are seeing another wave of change which is that instead of the 10 story, the 16 stories buildings that used to populate around the area, now they're going for the 40, 40 stories building. So each generation, because of Singapore's finite space, each generation preserves some of our memories and yet gives up some of our spaces for the next generation to build their memories. And that is the inevitable fact for a small country with finite space like ours. It's very different when I go to a larger country. For example, in Jakarta, where I used to stay two years. One of the first few things I noticed when I was in Jakarta is that there were unfinished construction sites. And because I went there after the financial crisis of 97. So there are quite a lot of unfinished construction sites. So to a Singaporean, a blur Singaporean like me, went there and said, why are there unfinished construction sites? You know, in Singapore, you never see this. If the project gone bust, somebody will take over the place and then quickly you will build up something else in place. But in Jakarta, when there's a lot of land in Java, it's not like that. You just wait for the time to be good again and then we'll continue building. Anyway, we never tear down things because if we want to build some more new things, we will just expand to the outskirts and the outskirts will just keep growing. That's how cities grow. right? But for us, I mean, we can't just keep expanding. Right? I mean, even if we reclaim land, there isn't so much land for us to reclaim. So the inevitable fact of part of the Singapore identity is that each generation will try to preserve what we can, but yet each generation also rests on the paying forward of the last 
the last generation paid forward for us to be where we are. And I think it's also incumbent for us, while we preserve and seek to preserve our memory, we also pay it forward for the next generation to have the space. Take this place, where we are sitting now. These will be the memories of this generation of Republic Polytechnic students. But I will feel very aggrieved, and maybe Viswa will feel very aggrieved with me as well. Do you know what it used to be this place? It used to be our training area, right? It used to be our training area. You take the old maps of Singapore, the SAF used to train here. I dug a trench here. <laughs> I got soaked through my skin digging the trench here. I got ambushed and I patrolled. And I, I mean, it is my training area. It starts from the what we call Hill 265 across the SLE now, all the way to this part of the land. And you just take back the maps in the 1990s, it's a totally different place. There is no Woodlands New Town. The only Woodland Town was where the current wood, the old Woodlands Terminal, you know, the one before the causeway. That was Woodlands Town Centre. It is not here. This is my training area. Excuse me. <laughs> I remember. How many of you remember Lorong Chuntum? This one will remember. Lorong Chuntum used to be our training area, which is now just across from here. Right? And now it's all flat. Long Chuntum used to have a norm. I used to, I remember taking my military tactics test, company tactics test, right on top of Long Chuntum because it was a, 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 a knoll, a hill. Right? That I sat there almost like a, those are military scholar of the old Chinese. So he sit down there. Then I remember this famous person called Chan Chao Nam would come and uh, ask me, which way will you attack? You know, which way will you go? So I took my test that I have memories of Chan Chao Nam. For those of you who went through military service of that era, you will know this institution called Chan Chao Nam. Right? We used to say we've been through Nam, not Vietnam, but Chan Chao Nam. Right? He was the one who grilled us in all our tactics, and this was where we built our memories of how we have. But I can't be selfish and say that, excuse me, this is my training area, how dare you take it away? Because then the many thousands of people who are staying in Woodlands now would not have that space to build their memories. There won't be any Republic Polytechnic. So I have been very circumspect when I also try to preserve my memories because if I defend all of the memories that I can ever hold on to, then I think the next generation will have no memories, no space to build their memories. So this is the inevitable balance that we have to strike. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we eradicate everything that we... we I mean... If you ask URA, in a land scarce Singapore, the only place that is not constrained by height constraint because of our airways that we should really intensify and build is Chinatown. But we are not going to tear down Chinatown because that's part of our memories. So we find that balance and we try to find other ways to find places to meet our emerging needs and yet at the same time preserves the memory. And maybe now technology helps us a bit because now you can literally do the Google Earth thing and then go around and film everything and record everything down. So we have to find some ways using technology, we have to find some ways. But my point is that no matter what technology and no matter what it is, at the end of the day, every generation's memories is built on the paying forward of the last. And it's incumbent upon us in this generation to also remember that so that our next generation will also have some space to build their memories. Otherwise, in Singapore, it is a zero-sum game and that will be very dangerous for us. If I may just take this, and since I have the mic, I just want to make one comment about this a nation of complainers. Is it? I'm actually okay with that. Someone told me an angry customer is still a customer. right? <laughs> we can all complain. It's not a problem. Complaining is not a sin. Don't feel bad if you have to complain. Actually, you can just put it nicely, call it feedback. It's alright. Whether you call it feedback or you call it complain, it doesn't matter. It only becomes a problem if after we, as fellow Singaporeans, complain and didn't do anything about it. If we complain or we feedback and we do something about it, actually, it's our drive to improvement. I always say this to many people, that the reason that the SAF improved so fast compared to uh, all regular armed forces elsewhere, is because we have all the NS men and NSF in the world. And they will be the one giving you lots of feedback. right? And if you don't improve, they'll be very angry. So you improve. And you improve not just because the regulars try to improve to, make the S to meet the needs of the NS men and the, S the NSF. The NS men and the NSF also bring their ideas from all walks of life to help improve the SAF. 
So being a nation of complainers is not a problem. <laughs> it's only a problem if we complain and don't do anything about the complaint and expect somebody else to solve our problem, then it's a problem. And I think if you look at Singaporeans, I think generally we are a bunch of people who constantly want to improve our lives. Right? We, we feel very dissatisfied with small little imperfections. It's alright if we do something to overcome the imperfections. It's not alright if we see an imperfection, we complain, we feedback, but we don't do anything or expect somebody else to do that. Then I worry for the future of Singapore. But if that becomes a driving force for us to do better in all things that we do, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. So don't need to feel ashamed. We only need to feel ashamed if we do something, but I mean, we, we feedback and we complain, but we never do anything. Then we are in trouble. Then we are in trouble, expecting somebody else to solve our problem. But if you look at Singapore, I think generally people have that sense to want to improve. I think that's good.